a safe space for St. Louis to learn about soccer. This is Soccer 101 with Michelle Smallman and Moon Valjean. Michelle Smallman and Moon Valjean here with you. This is Soccer 101. It is the safe space for St. Louis to learn about soccer. And Moon, last week we had a great conversation with Don Tebow, a professional referee. We learned about the ins and outs of calling a game. But the World Cup has been going on, and we wanted to wait until the conclusion of the World Cup to really break it down. And gosh, I haven't even recovered from that final. First of all, how are you? Second of all, your reactions to the final. I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Okay, awesome. Let's get into it then. Uh, (laughs) What a final. Everybody that I've run into in the last couple of days has said, did you watch final? Did you watch final? Most exciting World Cup game of all time. And a lot of these people, I would say at least half of the people that are saying these things to me are brand new soccer fans, brand new to that world, and they're getting it. So I would just like to say thank you to the final, or at least the second half and the, the overtime halves and the PKs. First half was a little bit dull because you could really see some strategy in there, and it was interesting to watch the French. But we'll get into that in in, in just a minute. Um, but I'm sure you're getting the same thing. You're, this was maybe one of the greatest thing constantly, how this was maybe one of the greatest World Cup matches of all time. Of all time. I don't even know if there was really any debate. It had the drama. It had the star power. You had two uh, superpower teams in Argentina and France. A lot of history, the lineage there, the storylines were there with Messi and France trying to go back to back. And then for a matchup like that to be that good on paper, to actually supersede what we expected of it from the, the game is so rare. And I I think it was the best, maybe one of the best sporting events I've ever seen, period. I know being in St. Louis, we have emotional ties to other things like game six of, of the World Series or what the Blues did in the Stanley Cup. But on a global scale, Moon, I don't know if anything's ever going to top that. Yeah, which is wild that you say that because if there's ever been something that sort of made me think that maybe we're living in a simulation... <laughs> It was that. Uh, go on. I don't mean to be conspiracy theory hold guy on, here. Hold on. Let me adjust my tinfoil hat. Go yeah, ahead. Go I ahead. don't mean to be conspiracy <laughs> theory guy here, but you, you see like, oh, well, you know, all sport is set up and the, uh, with all the politics and all that kind of stuff aside with all the Qatari stuff um, and then the ownership of some of these guys in the French League, it's owned by so-and-so that has involvement with this World Cup. I mean, to have Messi versus Mbappe and, like, you know, the two, like, poster children of, of this uh, uh, of this World Cup, duel it out like that in extra time, in overtime, mm-hmm. in PKs. I mean, and for it to end the way that it did, too, we may be living in a simulation. This is the first strike really against uh, against that for me. I live for a good conspiracy theory, Moon. I don't know if you know this about me, but you're right, especially with all the negative press that Qatar had gotten and, you know, with the tragic and uh, and just shocking passing of American soccer journalist Grant Wall and all the speculation because of his criticism of Qatar and what had been happening um, there because of the World Cup. There was, and obviously his family has come out and stopped that speculation, but there was just a, a big yeah. spotlight that was shown again on what was going on there and kind of how unsettling it was. And no one thought about that during the final because right. you had yeah. the two biggest stars, the two teams that you wanted to see in the most dramatic of fashions. And you're right, to have it be Messi, who who was the hero, and Mbappe for France, you just really can't script it any better. It was so perfect, maybe too perfect, but we're not going to get into any of that. Even though there's some, some of that uh, hubbub is justified and all that in the sports washing, let's not bother with that right now. It's not necessarily our forte, but the sport is. So let's get back into the game. Let's do it. Uh, and let, let's get into the game and the cup. Which would you prefer to start with? Why don't we do the game? Okay. The game, I would say, uh, initially, um, and my wife has this documented, actually, on, on Instagram or ins- her Instagram stories. I was sitting down uh, for the first, uh, for the majority of the first half. It was very um, Argentinian uh, uh, dominated. Yep. They had all the energy, they had all the spirit, and they had all the ball. Um, but as you saw, as that half sort of went on, that was somewhat France's strategy, not to let Argentina have the ball, but to let them, knowing that Argentina had the energy, they had the legs on them, uh, 
to, to sort of sit back and be the stronger ones that had more patience rather than go get them, go get them, go get them, because chances are this was going to be a long game that maybe went into overtime. And the last thing the French wanted was PKs. Everybody knew that. The Argentinian goalie is spectacular with PKs. Statistically, he's been one of the best in the last couple decades. The guy's great. Loves the mind games. Yeah, and Lloris is a fantastic captain and a wonderful goalie, but he's not a PK specialist. Also, very well known. So the French... The French nightmare would have been to go to PKs, which is eventually what happened. But that first half was interesting because for new soccer watchers that, let's say, are like the uh, the Christmas and Easter Christians that only show up for the finals, right? Yep. Um, they showed up, and this first half was not a, a giant selling point in action or high score. But that all changed in the second half. How did you feel about the first half before we move on? So... I was very hyped going into the game because of everything we just outlined, the star power, the matchup. I thought it was going to be a great game. And then you have Messi coming out, getting the goal. As you mentioned, Argentina absolutely dominating the first half. They controlled possession. Um, The shots on goal, not there for France. And I watched the game with my family, and I remember saying to my dad, Kylian Mbappe has been virtually invisible in the first half. That is not going to be the case the entire game. You know a star of that caliber and a player of that caliber is going to find a way to make himself known. And even without a lot of their star players, uh, you knew that France was still the defending champions and they would tactically have the book a little bit on Argentina after the first half and be able to come back. And... 2-0 2-0 is the most dangerous lead in sports, Moon. And you you just knew that France was not going to go down without a fight. So even though it was lacking a little bit of the drama, I think a lot of people loved to see Messi score in the first half. And they loved to at least have that storyline kind of playing out. But at least for me, watching the first half, I knew that it wasn't just going to be that repeated in the second half. Yeah, and not, I'm not some tactical genius or experienced coach or any of that kind of stuff, but I kept saying... Uh, to the people that I was talking to right before the game, is uh, Argentina's plan has to be scored within the first 20 minutes. If France gets the first goal, Argentina is going to have their back against the wall, period, because they are that energy, burn the legs, mm-hmm. burn the fuel, and, 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 and France is tactically known for allowing that kind of stuff to happen and then just pickpocketing you when it needs to. They make and, the adjustments. And because they have the skill, they have the players, they have the tactics. So... When Argentina jumped ahead, it was actually kind of no surprise. It, it was somewhat, uh, okay, we all see the very planned strategies. This is exactly how all of us talked about that this game would be. Argentina coming out hard, France coming out with a little bit more patience and a bit more uh, stoicism, mm-hmm. and then turning it on. And, dude, <clears throat> I don't get to watch Mbappe all that much. And when I do, it's, it's a highlight reel stuff. So, mm-hmm. of course, I'm seeing the best of his moments. Gee whiz, dude, that kid is so good. If he plays long enough, he will beat all these guys' records. He is that guy. Yeah, and that's what everybody's been saying, and you go, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, but if you watch that match and you don't think that's true, you're you're not watching. That that guy, he is, he's 23 years old. At 23, I was pretty confident I was doing some cool stuff, but not like that in a World Cup final. You know what I mean? Like the this composure, kid, the too. composure, the uh, the skill, the patience, the lungs, the legs, everything he showed um, made it so easy to be a soccer fan. Yep. So easy. And that was so fun. It was so fun to watch. So I was on the couch for the majority of the first half. At halftime, I was nervous. My heart was racing as <laughs> if, you know, my brother was on the team or something. Like I was so stressed out, worried. I know. I felt the same way. Imagine if you were a fan or, or that was your country that was competing in that game. I wouldn't have survived. I, I was an emotional wreck and I had no skin in the game. Me too. I don't even, I, there was even points where I was questioning if this is good for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's every sports fan at some point in their lives. Well, and and I hate to say that, but you know, I'm 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 like midlife right now. I'm in this age where I'm like starting to become a slight hypochondriac and I know that's you know that's on me and it's it's whatever, but like I actually got a little concerned with the pressure in my chest if this is good for me. But of course I couldn't turn it off. So my wife documented like I said before Every, I don't know, every six minutes that elapsed, I was another foot closer to the television. And in overtime, I had one foot up on the uh, on the brick, on the fire, on the, you know, whatever you call that thing, in front of the... The mantle, front, under the yeah, mantle? Yeah, under the mantle. I had one foot up because I was mere inches from the screen screaming about everything, just about everything, not being that guy. I mean, I was, I was just, 
I truly was just being a fan. I was so thrilled that I was watching uh, such skill on display. You saw even people like uh, 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 Raphael Varane, um, you know, towards the end there, like he just gassed out. I mean, he literally oh almost just hit his knees and, and said, get me off the field because he burned himself out. And this is not a guy that you saw sprinting end to end or any of that. He's one of the French defenders, Manchester United guy. Um, but you saw that these dudes were legitimately giving it their all and um, and not leaving anything behind. So it, it was pretty cool. What what are your uh, thoughts on the on the second half and that regulation whistle? Well, to echo what you said, just watching Mbappe rise to the occasion was spectacular. And it was really fun watching that because this is obviously sunsetting Messi's career. And you're watching Mbappe take the torch and run with it. And you're watching the next superstar on the biggest world stage say, I'm that guy. If you don't know who I am now, for all the new soccer fans who listen to this podcast who might have watched that game, who maybe didn't know who Kylian Mbappe was before that game, you're aware of him now. He's kind of, to steal from LeBron, the chosen one. He's... He has he had arrived before that. He is super arrived now. So that was fun to watch him. But towards the end there, knowing that it could potentially go into overtime to extras, I was watching Argentina and when they were barely hanging on, you talk about being gassed. I was watching this going, how are they going to be able from a conditioning standpoint to withstand more time? Because they just looked absolutely gassed in the second half. Yeah. Towards the I, end. Towards and, the end. I, and I think that was the French... That was the French's idea. I think that they wanted to do that. They knew that they would burn themselves out trying to get that first goal, maybe that second goal. And uh, and France played it right. They really did. And and sadly, um, I think France still deserved the win. But I think Argentina earned it. As much as that sounds contradictory, that's my position on it. Watching the game, France deserved it. Argentina earned it. And... Everything that uh, I I said it when it happened that last I think it was uh, was it Otamendi uh, that that got that near near breakaway right towards the end, and Martinez saved it and I said Martinez wins World Cup, that's it like that that's going to be the headline because <clears throat> that save right there towards the end is what pushed it to PKs and Argentina had the had the advantage and obviously took took advantage of that uh, in the win but that save without Martinez making that save um, the French win. Or if Mbappe was the one that was on it, he would have finished it. And uh, first of all, kudos to Mbappe for the hat trick. Oh Absolutely my God. incredible. And going back to echo your sentiments on Mbappe, um, my children now, I'm convinced and, and, and comforted that my children now have their Messi or their Ronaldo mm-hmm. as far as their generation gets to watch. And the only reason I say that now and I bypass somebody like Neymar Jr. is because Neymar Jr. really annoys the living hell out of me. <laughs> and, and, and I'm not exactly 100% sure why. I like the flamboyance. I like the crazy haircuts and I like that. But I hated that, that there was all this hype on Neymar. And everything I saw him do... Um, it was like the it was like the good came with the bad and the flopping and the crying and the this and that and I'm not saying that he's not a good sportsman and any of that I'm just saying some of his his highlights were not good for the sport for people that I was trying to get interested mm-hmm. he wasn't the Ronaldinho he wasn't the Messi or the Ronaldo and Ronaldo's had his moments with the diving and this and that but um, it, I was like oh crap this is what the next generation is this is who they're going to hang their hat on sure. and it kind of bummed me out. And seeing Mbappe just be a class act of of nothing but just pure, quiet, stoic skill. I'm so happy that my kids are going to get to grow up w- watching a player of that caliber and seemingly of that class. So I always say in every aspect of life, money talks and wealth whispers, if you got it like that, you don't really have to show it off all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I feel like Mbappe is that where he just knows he's got it like that. He doesn't, his, his, he's flashy in his own way, but he doesn't necessarily need to throw it in your face all the time. Like some of these other young players do. Yeah. So he's, he's the wealth, wealth whispers. And at times he whispers, but make no mistake. He will sneak up on you. Yeah, what a what a game. Uh, we oh, can, can I ask you a question before oh, yeah, we wrap me. it up? A lot. So I had tweeted, uh, shout out to the Soccer is Boring crowd. Rough day for them because it was the most <laughs> exciting day ever. And, you know, right. some people, Moon, make hating soccer or calling soccer boring a personality trait. That's just trendy. Yeah, the baseball, a lot of uh, baseball lifers or NFL lifers just never want to give soccer a chance. I said rough day for them. Uh, thoughts and prayers to them because it was a rough day for them. But a lot of response came from that tweet 
of people who don't like soccer being like, can you imagine, uh, you know, football or or hockey, a world championship being decided in, in PKs the way that it was. It, a lot of people think, uh, American soccer fans think that you should just play until you score, like a golden goal rule. rule. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, okay, whatever. I mean, you're the geniuses, right? You, you just know it all on how this should happen. This sport is <laughs> older than any of the sports that you just mentioned, but uh, yeah, maybe... Maybe you should make the rules. Listen, I, I'm, I think it's exciting both ways. I don't like World Cup finals being decided by PK, so I, 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 that's what makes the, the regulation and the overtime so much more exciting for me because I want something to, to differentiate these two. But um, at the same time, they've been doing this for a while, so chances are they probably know a little bit more about it than I do. And maybe we don't want to watch a bunch of gassed guys in 189 minutes uh, doing the same thing because I bet you you'd find something to bitch about there too. Uh, you know, you, you 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 can't get it right with the haters, and yeah. I don't. So why am I even concerned about the haters' issues with it? You know, you know what I'm saying. Like, totally. You, you don't hold much weight unless you actually care. Um, as as far as the sport goes, but I think PKs are so dramatic. PKs are so exciting, and there's strategy there too. Of Do course. I like them? Of course not. But at the same time, like. You got to have something. There's a tiebreaker. What, what, what are you talking about? NFL? They do coin tosses for who gets the ball first <laughs> on a golden goal. Like, what do you? We don't need to go there. And if you if you hate it, then that's fine. Hate that aspect of it. That doesn't take away from everything else that happened. How can you take away from the excitement of the 120 minutes that 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 did go? Yeah. Um, and I just think about those guys. And to your point, how gassed they were. And do you, do you want them to just play until their bodies give out, risk injury? I, I think that you if you don't want to go to PKs, if your team is not billed for that, you're right. It, it's added pressure for you to get it in regulation or overtime. But I love the strategy of 1v1. If, are, am I going to fake you out? Am I? Are you going to guess correctly if you're the goaltender? I think it's a completely different element of drama and entertainment and strategy. It is. And, okay, so we've put 11 versus 11 for 120 minutes now. We haven't found a victor. So now we're going to put it on the shoulders of the five selected few and the goalie, who's seen the least action most likely mm-hmm. as far as ball touches go for the 120 minutes. So we're going to shift it now to a different aspect of your existing players that are on the field to play this competition. So on paper, it's kind of the coolest way to do it. It's flipping the coin, but you're still on the coin. You you know, you're just using the other side of the coin Mm -hmm. to decide where the victor is. Okay, so your 11 couldn't do it as as 11. Well, now these six are going to do it as these six. And it's interesting to see how the strategies go into that. You know, we've, there's a famous, uh, I forget which World Cup it was, there was a famous missed PK because a superstar uh, uh, sub was brought in. He had super fresh legs, and he skied a ball because Ooh. the guy wasn't as tired as everybody else. Yikes. Um, so it's it's fun to watch that kind of stuff and, and play into it. Again, is it my favorite way to decide a World Cup final? Of course not, but grow up. This is life. This is what, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Like, I just, grow up. I'm just arguing to argue at this point. So um, that should be a segment, grow up, where we just pick out things that people don't like about soccer and we tell them to grow up. <laughs> that should be a show, but I'm sure it'd make a lot of friends. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it was it was an exciting game. If if you, I, there's not many people that are going to do this, but if there were a game to replay, and I know a lot of people, you know, don't like rewatching television shows or rewatching uh, rereading books or something like that. If you really want to get into soccer or even learn a, a bit more about how you can sort of watch soccer, rewatch that final. And rewatch it after you've listened to our podcast and maybe a couple others. You read some articles about the breakdowns of the, of the uh, uh, of the teams or or the match, and watch France again in that first half mm-hmm. and, and see that Argentina is dominating, but it's not that, like the French, uh, you know, were were at, were weak in in certain points. Kind of st- start to watch the game from more uh, of a strategic um, line, and I think you'll get you'll get a lot out of it. But let's not go too long on this episode. Let's let's go into just the World Cup as a whole. I think you wanted to do some top threes, right? Yes. Um, it was a very exciting and entertaining World Cup. At least I thought so. I'm, I don't know if you agree, Moon, but there were so many fun storylines and little nuggets that we could take away. So I thought it would be fun to wrap it all up, put a bow on it, and each give our three favorite things from the World Cup. I love that idea. You start. You want to go one, one, two, two, three, three? Let's do it. Okay. Why not? Okay. You start it off. Number one for me, um, I consider this World Cup a success for the U.S. men's national team. 
could they have advanced further? Sure. I thought that they were outmatched by the Netherlands and they they got out of the group stage, which is what we kind of expected with this young team. But I loved that Christian Pulisic got his first World Cup goal. And then after the groin hit and everything, him coming back and the toughness and heroics that we saw from him, that was my favorite thing because this is our Mbappe. He's our star. Christian Pulisic is the present and the future of the U.S. men's national team. And to see him get his first goal on the World Cup stage and get that seasoning in action and just to see that grit and toughness from him, that was one of my favorite things. That was for sure incredible. And to, and to piggyback on your uh, U.S. call out there, um, the U.S. did not qualify a few years back, and that really humbled us and, and, yes, it did. and really hurt. Um, and Italy did not qualify for this one, and that really humbled them, deservedly so, and they needed it. Um, so one of my favorite things is always rooting for the underdogs, especially in the group stages, to get out of the group stages. I was in Japan when Japan first made it out of their group stage uh, years ago, and it was one of the most exciting memories I'll ever have in my entire life, mm-hmm. being in Shibuya Station when that happened. So I'm always rooting for Japan or any underdog to get out. Obviously, Morocco is a story, the first African nation to uh, to reach anywhere near where they where they reached, and they ended up getting fourth place. Spectacular. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that they got there is probably... Uh, well, just any underdog, but Morocco in particular and uh, and Japan had had a great showing as well. I love watching those types of teams uh, overproduce any expectations and then also humble some of the people that thought they were going to get out of the groups that just didn't. Right. That is always a win for me. That's my win number one. So I'm with you. My number two was Morocco and their run to the semifinals. It was an unbelievable run. It was so um, exciting and just thrilling to see them get through. And I saw this. I'm pulling it up. Morocco is only the third semifinalist not from Europe or South, or excuse me, not from Europe or South America. There have been 88 semifinalists in the history of the Men's World Cup. 85 of them have been from Europe and South America. To just put in context how massive this was for Morocco to get through to the semifinals. And I think they were kind of the darlings of the tournament. It was very fun to see them go through. Um, and another Cinderella story was I absolutely loved Moon at the beginning, seeing Saudi Arabia take down Argentina. Oh, yeah, that was impressive. We forget about that because it happened That's so long right, ago. yeah. Yeah, good for them. I bet you they're going, hey, we beat the champions. <laughs> that's right. You know what I mean? That's that's a heck of an accomplishment. Uh, so that was your number two. That was my number two, was, was just Morocco in general, getting to watch them and see how special and cool it was for their nation. Uh, well, I'll, I'll piggyback on that. So getting able to, uh, being able to see and appreciate Mbappe is my number two. Uh, Mbappe, like I said, his, his name has been in the headlines since the last World Cup. I mean, you know, he's already won a World Cup. Uh, and and the kid has been doing spectacular things since he was an early teenager. Um, but people like me, even 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 fans like me that watch EPL all the time and getting more into the MLS and all that, I haven't seen Mbappe in person uh, for that many minutes consecutively um, ever, maybe. And be, uh, getting to watch him and really appreciate him in live time, in real time, and see why his stats are where they are. And even be able to be excited about where his stats may be. This this is going to be the record breaker. He is going to be, if he plays long enough, he's going to be the guy that everyone talks about that beats every single one of these numbers that we've talked about. Um, so being able to watch him. And also being able to watch him alongside some of the older fellers like Olivier Giroud, who I've been cheering for for, for mm-hmm. many years in the EPL and watched him do great things. Um very different player, slow, great on, uh, uh, great in the air, watching how they, they strategize with a player like that. I just love that. But my number two is really uh, my generation and, and the younger generations being able to watch Mbappe really bloom. Mm-hmm. That was my number two. Well, my number one was watching the GOAT get coronated. Lionel Messi... The debate was there between he and Ronaldo, and this was the deciding factor. The f- Watching at the end of his career him be able to finally capture his elusive World Cup was so special. And to do it in the manner in which he did, he, him getting the first goal, him getting the equalizer, he, he just couldn't have scripted it any better. And as someone who watches a lot of sports and makes a living out of sports. I think I mentioned this on the last podcast that I was cheering for Argentina and Messi. We love greatness. We love the GOAT debate. That's why we still debate LeBron and Michael Jordan and and all of the quarterbacks. But to 
it just wouldn't have felt right for me for Messi to not get a World Cup. And so to see him get to do it, and especially in the dramatic way that he did, I thought was not my number one thing. It was so awesome. Yeah, I think so. And I'm going to say something somewhat controversial in, in, in this, but my number one is very similar, very parallel to yours. It is all about Messi. Um, I'm a self-admitted. I, I, I was never a messy cheerleader. Not that he needed any cheerleading for me. I was always a Ronaldo guy in, in the split. Very, very close split, but I was always 51%. I would choose Ronaldo uh, over Messi if I was a coach. I said before this final that I've gone Team Messi, not only because of uh, all of Messi's heroics and what he's been uh, sort of evolving himself into, but also because of the Ronaldo drama and all that. But like you said... The deciding factor is now one of them is a World Cup champion, and the other one will most likely never be that. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting you say Jordan and LeBron, because this is also controversial. I think in 50 years, we'll still be talking about Jordan, and we're not going to be talking about James. I think James is going to be passed up in, in a lot of ways for a lot of different reasons. Some of it's branding, some of it's this, some of it's, some of it's just the drama that you can't shake. Uh, or that you can shake in Jordan's uh, in, in Jordan's, Jordan's example. <clears throat> With Ronaldo and Messi, in 50 years we're going to be talking about Messi. And the biggest deciding factor is probably going to be this World Cup win. And I don't think we're going to be talking about Ronaldo in the way that you think we're going to be talking about Ronaldo. Or I don't think we're going to be talking about Ronaldo in the way Ronaldo thinks we're going to be talking about Ronaldo. I think we'll be talking about Ronaldo when mm. his records are beat because he's up on the screen for... He's, he's eight goals behind Ronaldo, or now he's beaten Cristiano Ronaldo. But I don't think he's going to go into the lexicon or into the stone, if you will, like Messi will now. So I have to acknowledge that and respect that and cheer for that, what Messi now has done and what he can like know about his legacy, if, if that matters to him. It, th th those sort of things matter less and less as I get older. But I got a feeling they, they mean more and more to one Cristiano Ronaldo. Oh. I don't think anybody was more sad, including the French players on the field, <laughs> when Argentina well, won. Well, they already that. got, most of them got theirs. Right. That's, what <laughs> I, that, that's, why, I, that's why I think the most sad person in the universe when Messi won that was Ronaldo. Because somewhere deep down, he knows he's gonna, his name will wither faster than Messi's now. Yeah, and that's one thing that you can't buy. You, you, no matter what, and you can't earn it on your own. And that, for somebody like him, that's something that's probably going to haunt him for the rest of his life. But we are a sports society obsessed with championships. That's why we count rings. That's why Tom Brady is the GOAT. Is Tom Brady the best quarterback that's ever lived tactically um, from a skill set standpoint? Probably not. But he's the forever the goat because of the Super Bowl championships that he's he's won, and I doubt anyone will ever touch him in the in the modern game. Um, and I, I don't know, Moon. I'm such a a storyline person. I love to look back at the the road and how somebody got there, and just to listen to podcasts about Messi and read up about his life and the fact that his grandmother had to fight for him to even be able to play soccer because yeah. he was so small as yeah. a kid and, you know, him pu putting up both fingers for her after he won and all of the Argentinian people chanting outside of her house. And just to think that that one thing of him growing up, if she didn't fight for him to be able to play soccer, would we not have the champion and the goat that we have today? Yeah. And I just thought that it was really a special World Cup that couldn't have been capped off with a better game or with a better storyline in the GOAT being coordinated. That's a great point. He's got the most interesting early chapters. Mm -hmm. And this chapter, which is not even his last chapter, is such a such a popping, powerful, powerful chapter. Again, I think that this book stays on the shelves far longer than Ronaldo's. And I know people are going to be upset with that. And again, man, I got Ronaldo jerseys. I got, the, I got a dozen of them. I'm a fan. But he's lost me recently, and Messi's gained me. And I think I am not, uh, I, I don't think I'm unique in that. I think a lot of people have now gone Team Messi. And not just because he won, but just like like you said, all the things that are involved with it. And maybe we'll see Messi in the MLS. That's the talk. That's the rumor. Uh, but what what a thing. What else is left to do, buddy, now that you've won a World Cup? It's almost like, you know, after you win the Super Bowl, you go to Disneyland or Disney World, excuse me. What are you going to do? Maybe come to America. Hang out with David Beckham in Miami. Who knows? Yeah, I guess the only headline that we can touch uh, here since we'll, we'll wrap it up is that um, 
a lot of people were expecting Messi to retire from at least international football because mm-hmm. he's got a, a few years on his contract over in France or whatever it is. But uh, he did come out, I don't know if you saw this, he did come out and say that he is not retiring from the national team. He still has work to do. So good for him, and I guess we can uh, guess we can leave it there. But man, what a World Cup. What a World Cup. And what a year so far on the podcast. This has been such a fun endeavor to do with you, Moon. Thank you to everyone who has listened in 2022. And this will be our, our last one probably for the year, right? I would imagine so, but we'll be back early January. Yeah, because we have the holidays coming up. So everyone have a safe and happy holidays with your family. Thank you so much for all of your contributions, your emails, your tweets, downloading, clicking on the podcast, your interaction. It's been really fun for Moon and I to do this. And the next time we speak to you, 2023, the clock is ticking. St. Louis City SC will be kicking off in the new year. A lot to talk about, Moon. But until then, happy holidays. It's going to be here in no time. Merry Christmas. Go!